uh, we're thrilled to be here and super, super excited to get to know all of you here. And two years ago, we couldn't even imagine to be invited to be keynote speakers at any conference. And yet, we are here with you today at the very first PyCon Israel. And I must say that it, it's really hard to believe it's the first conference in Israel because it's so well organized and we feel super, super welcome. So big round of applause for organizers because they are doing amazing job. So I'm Ola Sendecka. And I'm Ola Sitarska. Uh, we both have years of experience working with Python and Django, uh, which we used to build projects at Potato in London. Um, we are also members of the Django core team, and together we also organized um, DjangoCon Europe in 2013, 16, and as well as Django Under the Hood conferences. Ola also has a really awesome YouTube channel <laughs> called Coding is for Girls, where she teaches programming for beginners. Most importantly, Two years ago, we started Django Girls. And if you, know what, if you don't know what Django Girls is, it's a global initiative that teaches women an introduction to Python and Django, and it's totally free for all attendees. We created a tutorial that covers things from the very, very basic stuff, from how the internet works, through basic syntax of Python, through building your whole Django application, up to deploying to Python anywhere. And in our tutorial, we assume that uh, the attendees has no previous experience with programming, so we make sure that we do not use jargon. Django Girls is all about organizing the one-day events, workshops that aim to give women an opportunity to try programming and get excited about it. Mm, many times in previous years when people ask us, like, why are there few women in IT? We always heard the argument stating that women are just not interested in programming. But it's simply not true. Wherever, like, in any place in the world when we organize a workshop, they are almost always oversubscribed, and we cannot keep up with the demand for them. And Django Girls workshop are now organized literally everywhere. And in the last than two years, we, the Django Girls virus spread pretty much to all the continents except Antarctica. But me and Ola are not organizing every single one of them. And the Django Girls events are organized by many local organizing teams. And they use resources and tools provided by us. And in a very short time, we grew just from two people, us, to amazing number of 352 organizers, which is amazing number. And Django Girls gave opportunity to 4,500 women to start the adventure with programming. And you can imagine how weird it is when one day you are rather awkward, slightly introvert person who is writing software for a living like me, and next day you run a charity, try to coordinate amazing number of people and giant project. And honestly, nobody taught us how to do that. And we had to invent and learn things as we go. And now people come to us and, wa and ask us, uh, how did you grow Django Girls so big in such a short time? Or how do you keep people motivated? What is the recipe for a friendly, welcoming community? Or they just ask us if they could um, take our organizer's manual, which we actually have a or manual for our organizers, and use it as a basis for some other events. These questions made us really happy, but also made us realize that we could do a lot more to share this knowledge with the community. And I must say, we learned a lot these past years, and we are very happy to share our stories. And we hope that you will be able to take all our lessons learned and apply that to your open source project, or events you want to organize in your region, or maybe just to inspire someone you know to do something awesome. And the thing is, it does not require from you a big of knowledge and experience at the beginning. All it takes is motivation to make a big change. And I know that every single person in this room is capable to do something incredible. OK, so with that, let's take a look at what we've done with Django Girls and how you can implement that in your community. So me and Bola are both programmers. So we always naturally like to approach all of the problems with like engineers' point of view. 
So when we were preparing this talk, we realized that one of the key factors behind the success of Django Girls is in fact that it was designed to scale from the very beginning. And when it comes to like computer science, when you want to make your app scalable, you just go and Google something and there are as many options to choose from. But what about a community? It's not that easy and there is not a recipe or too many resources out there you could use. It's all about right architecture. And I must say that uh, we didn't necessarily thought about scalability two years ago when we started Django Girls. But in retrospect, retrospect we somehow made it right. So two years ago at EuroPython 2014 in Berlin, we organized the very first Python and Django workshop for beginners. And we planned it to be very small, just 20 attendees, but then it turned out to be smaller, uh, like too, too small, so we scale up to 45 people. And it turned out the workshop was super successful, and both attendees and coaches or even other people just came after the workshop to us as asking, how they can do that or, and how they can contribute to Django Girls. And a lot of those people are still involved with Django Girls and also Django itself. So around that time when our first workshop was taking place, we received an email from organizers of PyCon Australia and they wanted us uh, to help them to organize their own workshop. And then we received another request from someone on the other side of the world asking if they can if we can come there and actually organize the workshop for them. And we were like, uh, we don't really have time for that. We've got jobs and life and all of that. So we simply cannot go everywhere. But people really wanted it and kept asking us. So even during EuroPython, we had five or six people approach us and to ask us if they can do something and help and bring it to their city. It's back then that we realized that we can make a much bigger difference by helping other people organize workshops uh, on their own. Since we thought it's not really a rocket science, and with a little guidance and help and support, everyone can do it. So at the sprint at EuroPython, we started writing our organizing manual. And this document summed up what is necessary to organize uh, or recreate Django Girls workshop. So things like catering, uh, finding sponsor, logistics, finding venue, uh, decorations, or making the event friendly and welcoming. And we basically took all our experiences from previous or, or, uh, conferences we organized, hackathons, sprints, and meetups, and made this giant brain dump and put that in, inside this document. And ever since then, documenting the process and sharing knowledge were the most important things that allowed Django Girls to grow. And this is what made Django Girls scale. Documenting the process and making sure that the uh, whole thing is not dependent on one server or person made a huge difference. When you design your system architecture, you don't want to have a single bottleneck that stops you from growing. And we made sure that we are not a one. At work at Potato, we build a lot of projects for Google, so they need to scale. And one of our common jokes is that we approach all of the problems uh, and all of the projects as they're going to become a next Gmail. And we think that with Django Girls, we kind of approach the problem in a similar fashion. However, if you focus on scalability and building something super robust at the very beginning of your project, you might, may fall into a trap. And you might be tempted to build something very complicated and too clever. And you don't really know at the beginning if your idea has any sense and people will like it. And in startup world, it, this problem is very well known, and the idea of so-called minimal viable product is something for every entrepreneur know. And is there even a point of building a complicated application or complicated infrastructure around your community if people will not use it? And we had this question in mind when we organized our first workshop, and we wanted to deliver something cool and see if it works. So our main goal, we tried to focus on our main goal, which was to encourage women to programming. And even though it was tempting to build something, uh, like build everything right from the very beginning, we started very, very slow. So before we will jump into building yet another Facebook or Twitter, we would probably want to implement something small at first and see if it works and what people want and need. The same is true for growing communities. If there is no community, an optimization of nothing is still going to result in nothing. It's important to focus on the things that are the most important. We wanted to make sure we've got our basics right before we move on and add more complexity. 
So pretty much, we started with a very minimal viable product, and that was our workshop in Berlin uh, two years ago. Probably the fact that we only had like two months to organize everything and write a whole tutorial on top of our day jobs accounted for the fact that we just didn't have enough time to over-engineer everything. So at the beginning, we used Google Forms uh, as a sign-up process, and our website was just plain HTML and CSS, hosted on GitHub pages. We had absolutely no automated process of, uh, or emailers, or everything was very, very minimal and very manual. And we only pretty much planned for one workshop, so there was no point in writing very complicated uh, and automated infrastructure about around it. So pretty much second and third workshop were still just like uh, adding extra HTML uh, to our existing website. And honestly, Django Girl's website had no Django for months. <laughs> so if anybody will rush you in to automate everything from day one, remember the golden rule of no premature optimization. When the right time comes to that you actually need something and you are on a short deadline, you will find a simpler and a much faster way to build something uh, that's actually needed by people. One of the biggest temptations uh, you could have is to do things you like the most, like you enjoy the most, like building something like to schedule talks for a conference, but you could actually do that by hand. Um, sometimes it's nice to waste time on things like that, but when you build something that um, you want to see results as soon as possible uh, with a minimal effort, you need to focus on those things that are the most important and will bring the biggest effect. This kind of approach actually has a name, and it's called the Pareto Principle. And we didn't realize at the time when we built Django Girls that we are actually using this principle. But it's pretty cool when you, like, at some point go back and realize that you use some very fancy economics rule without <laughs> even knowing that. You feel very smart. So <laughs> um, if you don't know what the Pareto rule is, uh, Pareto rule states that 80% of effects comes from 20% of causes. What that means is if you invest your time in the correct 20%, and if you do it right, uh, you will achieve big impact with pretty much minimal effort. And both me and all our full-time programmers, so whatever time we spend on our community work is always in our spare time. So applying Pareto rule, we manage to achieve so much with very li limited resources. So as we mentioned, at the beginning, we didn't focus on building any website or application forms, nothing automated. Even though as web developers, we were very tempted to just focus on that. Instead, we focused our efforts on writing a really good tutorial, a uh, Django tutorial that is tailored for complete beginners. Uh, we searched the whole internet, and there was nothing that we thought is good enough that actually assumes no previous knowledge. And we believe that the experience of people in our workshop depended on it. This was not the most pleasant or, uh, or things we wanted to do the most, but was the thing that we thought is going to bring the biggest effect. After that, we focused our efforts on um, writing a really detailed documentation about how to organize our workshop and how to coach at it. And that, on top of a very good tutorial, was essential for Django Girls to grow. And also having the time constraint for the first workshop uh, also made us focus on shipping and reusing existing things. As developers, when we create yet another website, we are not reinventing the wheel and we don't start from scratch. We are using libraries and frameworks. And the thing is that you pretty much can apply the same thing to your community. And it's nothing wrong to standing on, t on the shoulders of the giants. So whenever possible, we try to see if anyone is doing something we like and try to implement it also on Jungle Girls level and then start to build on top of that. So, for example, parts of our coaching manual or parts of the tutorial were inspired by some open source resources. For example, we took a huge inspiration from Ray Skulls. They've man, won many workshops before and they had the whole rule about three attendees per one coach which we just didn't even think twice. We adopted it, and it's one of the very few things that makes Django Girls workshops work really well. In the first version of the tutorial, we had a very little, of the, a little idea of a challenge that it is to install Python on Windows or Ubuntu machines, just because we didn't use them. So we provided some instructions gathered from the internet, 
And since then, they were um, massively improved by thousands of people who run through the tutorial and troubleshoot the installation. I think they're basically now trouble, uh, like bulletproof. And I know it's tempting to implement everything from scratch and, um, and find the best way and reinvent the wheel. But if you want to build something fast, it's always good to use something that already exists and put, uh, build on top of that and improve it. And that gives you some extra time to focus on things that will give you biggest effect. So th things that give you bigger difference. And for us, the biggest challenge was to figure out how to find people who would like to contribute to Django Girls and become our community. So that is why over months we developed a real onboarding process. We finally had some time to look back at all, all of what we did and we made a proper Django Girls website where we managed uh, to automate many aspects of workshops such as uh, a website for the event, giving you tools to manage applicants, sending emails and so on and so on. And pretty much from the very, very beginning, everything we created was open sourced and that allowed many people to take it, build on top of that and then contribute back to us. As part of our onboarding process, we make sure to give you access to our community of organizers. This way we also leverage the collective and experience um, knowledge of all of the people, like hundreds of organizers now in our community. And it's much more of a stable system with many sources of data. In case both of us are on holidays, like right now, Django Girls can still thrive. If you want to have more people contributing to your idea, you need to put an extra effort and focus on making your uh, onboarding process easy and accessible to everyone. Your priority is to enable others to help you. Only by letting new, motivated people in, you have a chance to build a truly strong and, and diverse community. We also believe that community of organizers is Django Girls' strongest asset. And our organizers are generous, kind, and really passionate about programming and the community. And they are not only focused on beginners. A lot of Django Girls organizers and attendees are now contributing to Python Software Foundation, Django Software Foundation, organizing local Python meetups, and sharing knowledge and conferences. And from the very, very beginning, we were looking for leaders, people who can multiply the impact. And this was actually an advice uh, we received from Russell Keith McGee. Our first workshop uh, provided financial aid for attendees and Django Software Foundation generously provided help. And Russell, who was DSF president at the time, advised us to ask one additional question in our application form for attendees, which was how you are planning to share the knowledge you will gain during the workshops. This question is the default one in, our, in the application form used in all of the events. And it helps us find people who want to go and teach others, people who want to organize workshops in their cities, make a positive difference in someone else's life, pay it back to the community. It's amazing how many people really wanted to do that, and it's all about empowering them and showing them how to get started. And the important thing is to realize that empowering does not mean doing everything for them. And it's very important to let people do their job the way they like. One of the things that makes me work much, much harder and stay motivated for a longer time is when I feel that I have control and I own the project. And we believe that encouraging people to take responsibility for something empowers them and let them go outside of our comfort zone. And Django Girls, even though it provides you a working recipe for the workshop, does not make you do everything our way. So we have just a few rules that are required when you want to organize the workshops, which are it must be free for attendees, women have priority uh, for the workshop, and we advise to use our tutorial. But apart from that, you are not obligated to do anything our way. You can just take our advice if you want. But yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense because um, running the workshop in Poland or London is totally different than running that in Israel, Namibia, or in Seoul. So what we try to achieve is to help people to feel that the Jungle Girls workshop they organize is their own success. It is sometimes tempting to force people to do things your way. 
Um, for example, you might hate using try accept clause in your code and you will make every contributor not to use it. But how many people would feel discouraged to do any further work if you enforce them on every single detail? Especially if you're quite a perfectionist and you're trying to make sure everything is nice and really good. And forming, um, forcing people to do everything your way, um, only defined way, would also mean that we would lose all of the power and collective knowledge and diverse views and ideas of people in our community. So it's important to let different people to give their input and see all the different ways they can improve the thing you are building, your community, your project, the ways you will never thought about. And all it happens when you allow people, people different from you to get excited over one common goal, something that is dear and unique for your community. Because of that, we always encourage people to be themselves and try to do things their way. And this is what we did with Jungle Girls at the beginning. Uh, and I think that makes special is the fact that we weren't afraid to be authentic and haven't tried to be someone else. We said no to the pizza and unisex t-shirts, all classroom style workshops room, and we embraced things that we personally think are joyful and fun for us. That's why our workshops are full of decorations, cupcakes, balloons, yoga classes, healthy snacks, and uh, that makes us stand out. And all of that is now a typical for any Jungle Girls event. It obviously also makes organizing the workshop super fun. It's like organizing birthday party. This is also important because it builds a brand and identity for us. And the um, best thing is that every organizer can actually has a freedom to embrace it and, and do it their own unique way. We are proud of what we achieved with Django Girls. And lots of people now reach out to us asking if they can replicate Django Girls model and it makes us very happy and proud. But the fact that everything we do is open source means that people can just grab it and, and build their own projects with it. But we also always try to encourage them to use their work as a base and put their own unique twist on it. And being authentic wouldn't be possible for us if we tried to be very formal and professional all the time. Instead, we decided to be just human, keep our friendly tone in our communication and trying to not force ourselves into anything formal. That is why Jungle Girls is all about yays, rainbows, and excitement all around. So yeah, this is, I think it's very important because volunteer-run communities in, um, are based on the work of people who are contributing their free time. And I think giving people a little bit of fun and excitement makes them going and keep them motivated. And this approach also touches a lot of our processes. We could make our onboarding process uh, fully automated, but we think that people contact is very important. And we believe that tiny things like handwritten thank you notes for our supporters are making a big difference. Being grateful and recognizing the work people put into your projects is a very hard but also important task. And we are still struggling to sometimes make it right. We are doing our best, but there are times when, the, um, for example, we cannot keep up with a queue of pull requests waiting for review. Struggling to keep up, however, is not new for us, because since our community grew so, uh, so, so big and so quickly, there are times where we just need to um, really have a struggling with answering email quickly. And, um, and we are scared just to open our mailboxes. And this is because we grew super, super big. Like in less than two years, we had 180 workshops organized in 60 different countries, allowing 4,500 attendees to start the adventure of programming. And our tutorial was read by a quarter million of people, which is amazing. We should start to write books and become <laughs> authors. <laughs> so, we expanded documentation uh, on our internal processes, coaches' manual, organizers' manuals. Um, we added email templates, sponsor brochures, examples, um, design resources, and so on and so on. And we open source everything. So if you're interested, you can go to junglegirls.org slash resources or at our GitHub account, take in and build something on top of that. 
at some point you start to realize that things are just going out of hand. And there was a time when we just had to spend a week to answer an email and people were going quite angry with us. And things were just going worse and worse. But letting go of control and allowing people to make a decision about your project is hard. Uh, being overprotective about your project may actually result in you killing it. You are not able to do everything yourself, so we both realized we need to ask for help. Obviously turned to friends who contributed to Django Girls from the Civ, almost from the very beginning, and ask if they would like to be more involved into like maintaining the organization. And we were aware this is an extra responsibility and uh, it will bring more work to their lives, so we made sure that they are aware of that. And this is how Django Girls support team uh, started. So now, what makes a good team? The team is not the sum of skills and knowledge experiences of each member of the team. Good team will work much, much faster than that and will embrace everyone's skills. And bad team will make an overall productivity much lower than this value. So when choosing people for your team, make sure to look for people who are problem solvers and bring enthusiasm and excitement into your team. Make sure to bring different perspective and diversity of views because that makes your team stronger and more empathetic. It's also important that the core values of the team are shared between people and even though you sometimes disagree, you are able to find a common consensus and move on. You also want to be sure that all team members are playing for the biggest, the maximum gain of the whole team, not uh, for their own benefit. You also want to have people who are not afraid to say, hey, I don't know how to do it, can you help? Or I feel bad and I'm sorry, I won't be able to finish it. So even though we grew support team more and more, the number of emails were still overwhelming and it was growing fast enough that we couldn't handle it. We also came to the point that a lot of our team members, the support team members, were very tired and close to burnout. It was about a year since we started Django Girls, and we're still working um, on it alongside our full-time jobs. And this is when we decided that it's no longer sustainable and we need to find a way to grow without sacrificing our well-being. So we made a decision to hire our first part-time employee to help us manage the daily operations of Django Girls organization. It was the only logical move for us. Well, if you have too many servers to take care of uh, on your own, you start to think about uh, hiring DevOps, right? And whereas it's very obvious when you are a company, it's not that obvious when it happens in your open source community or open source project. So it was not easy for us. We had to fundraise enough money to secure a position for at least a couple of months going forward. And the recruiting process also took a lot of time and effort. We had almost 70 applicants and interviewed many of them. Meanwhile, we also wanted to make sure we document all of our internal processes in our team, which we actually made public and transparent too. So then the onboarding process of our employee can go smoothly. After that, we hired Lucy in September last year. Hiring her was the single best decision we made to make sure that we can grow Django Girls sustainably and move forward without sacrificing anyone's sanity and well-being. As I mentioned before, everyone in our support team came really close to burnout and we're now making sure that we try to keep an eye on each other and make sure it does not happen again. And taking a step back, especially in open source, is not an easy decision. And mental health is a really big issue in tech. During last year, two people stepped down from our support team. And we find it very, very important to make sure that people uh, in our community know that stepping down is nothing to be ashamed of and it's an all, only one natural step you can do when you are overcommitted. So when you build your community or the open source project, you must be very, very careful and make sure that you give people way to safely and gracefully step down. If you want to learn more about overcommitment and mental health issues connected to that, I really recommend watching amazing DjangoCon Europe talk given by Mikey and Eric. It was amazing. It was at DjangoCon Europe yes. this year. Um, and as you see, there are many things we did well and many we still are trying to figure out. 
everything we do is an unknown, and we don't know if it's gonna work out or not. But without trying and experimenting, there is no chance to grow, innovate, or change anything. Organizing our first workshop was a big experiment. Then letting others do it was an experiment. Starting a foundation, or hiring someone, or sending our t-shirt shop with Code Like a Girl, or This Is What a Programmer Looks Like t-shirts, was also an experiment. Not all of them were successful, and we have a quite a number of things that just didn't work out. But it's okay, because what you really want to do is to find these ideas at work and kill those that don't. And I must admit, Django Girls gave me loads of self-confidence. And now I know that even if I don't know how to solve the problem, I know that I somehow fig figure it out in the end. And that gives you an amazing power and feeling that nothing really could stop you. You will no longer feel, f uh, you will no longer fear that you will fail. And you just start to think about all the possibilities of things you could build. And finally, you should not be afraid to step up and try. If there is something that you always wanted to do but were worried that were, you have not enough motivation to do it right, just go and do it. Try something small and see how it works for you. You don't need to commit to uh, create a whole charity that teaches thousands of women around the world Python and, and Django. And honestly, if you would plan it this way, we would never thought that we can do it. So just take your time, see what works best for you. And it's not a shame to fail. It's a shame not to try. It's pretty much like starting my YouTube channel. I have thought about at least like two years and I always thought that, oh, I don't know, I want to do that. The quality will be bad or I will, it's too much work. People will know how I look like and things like this. And recently I just, just stopped worrying and started it and I have a lot of fun with that. So all it takes is just you wanting to change something, to do something. And with a little bit of motivation, every single person in this room is, is uh, able to do something incredible. So you only need to try. And the good news is that we already know good practices from your software career. Growing a sustainable community is very much like writing software. Good rules of thumb that um, you use when you build your project, like designing it to scale, and no premature optimization, building using existing libraries, may very well apply to community as well. And the rest, you will just learn on your way. So the question was, uh, after one day workshop, is there any follow-up that helps people to continue the programming adventure? So currently, we are. Uh, it depends on local organizers, as a Django girls, we don't have like next levels of workshops yet, which would be awesome, but yeah. it just like <laughs> just don't have time for everything. Uh, but we we know that some organizers are uh, creating like the uh, weekly meetups after that. We also encourage people to get involved into the local communities. So there are like Python meetups or there are uh, Django cards in um, in Poland, so there are a lot of places you can go afterwards, and we make sure that people know what is available in the place. Because, like for example, I, I have no idea how I would be able to organize the uh, like monthly meetups in uh, Africa, for example. It is uh, something that local organizers do. Yeah, uh, on top of that, we also kind of encourage people to stay in community and stay in touch, either organize workshop or coach or um, or get involved into developing Django Girls website. We actually had two people from Poland who uh, got together. One of them attended in Warsaw, the second one in Krakow. They got together and built like an addition to our website, uh, which is open source. So after that, they both got jobs because of that. Yeah, so, so pretty much we encourage people to use whatever is there and uh, try to give them pretty much the community they can join so they are not left alone. So the question was how to get around the problem of not having enough documentation and instructions in a local language. So our tutorial is actually translated to 12 or 13 languages now. So one of the options is actually to go and translate something. And this is what most um, places do. For example, in Django Girls Seoul, they actually translated their material and then they also came up with um, extra material they used during code camps. So they organized like a six week program after it. So I think like it's just, 
just takes a lot of work to actually come up with local and native language materials, but it's doable and lots of people are doing it. So we've got now 13 languages and there is, it's still open source so you can go ahead and, and start translating and then we'll publish it. So the question was uh, that Django Girls community is very, very distributed now and it's mostly the community lives in internet and what are the challenges and problems we face because of that? So I think um, our main, so internet qu works quite well for communication. So we've got like a Slack channel and we've got a mailing list where people can communicate. We are still trying to find a way to get everyone in the same room so they can actually talk about the things they do and talk about the things they started, like girls from Seoul are doing the code camps and they could share the knowledge with others. And that would be much easier if we can get everyone in the room. So we are hoping to plan like a Django Girls Organizers Summit. We're actually doing like dinners during conferences because there's now a Django Con Europe. Yeah, last month there was like 25 organizers who are attending the conference. So we are able to get them in the room and get them to exchange ideas and share knowledge. But we are still kind of trying to find a way and we are hoping to organize the summit this year. Um, I'm not sure if there are any challenges we are facing. I, I think that like the biggest challenge for us, uh, as being like co-founders, is that sometimes people think that we we have like bigger power than we really do. It's just like we are just random two programmers that decided to do something nice to others, and it was good enough that people just pick it up. And I think the. Um, it's really hard sometimes when um, like you, you cannot speak with people face to face and just like tell them, you are doing an awesome job. You're sh you should be really, really proud of yourself. And I think the other fact is just like a barrier language sometimes. Oh, yeah. Because we are just working with people from all over the world, from Asia and Africa. And it's just sometimes hard to exchange the like, culture and language barrier through internet. Sometimes we get emails in very different languages. Yeah. But thankfully, Google Translate works good. <laughs> so we try to then uh, redirect emails to the local teams. Yeah, local teams who, are, who can answer in the native language. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the biggest barrier probably. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.